Open your Bibles, if you will, to the second chapter of Mark. Tonight we're going to preliminarily look at two contrasting passages. We're going to make some points, and then we're going to sort of expound on those points. So, uh, Mark, the second chapter, beginning in verse 18. It says, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it, and the new from the old, and a worse tear results. No one puts new wine in old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, the wine is lost, and the skins as well. But one puts new wine and fresh wineskins. This parable is really interesting and very important to the constructs of Jesus' ministry because it's repeated in several Gospels. But the parable itself is not actually what I'm going to talk about right here. I want to talk about the question that the Pharisees ask. They inquire of Jesus why His people aren't fasting. And Jesus' reply shows something about the intent of this question. Because Jesus' answer to them shows effectively that there are times at which it is inappropriate to do a thing. For example, bridegrooms, uh, the company of the bridegroom doesn't fast while the bridegroom is with them. And you don't put new wine in old wineskins or else bad things happen. And so when you do these things, sometimes they lose their purpose. And so what Jesus is saying to these Pharisees is effectively that their fasting has lost the purpose that it was intended for. So why then, if it's lost its purpose, are they fasting? And the answer, I believe, we can see clearly when we look contextually at really the whole gospel and looking at the Pharisees, is that they're fasting because that's what holy people do. Since John's disciples are fasting, the Pharisees are fasting, holy people are fasting. So if I want to look like a holy person, I need to be fasting, according to the Pharisees. If you look over now in Nehemiah 9, you see a very different view of what also happens to be fasting, though that's simply a coincidence in these two stories. So, in Nehemiah, they build the wall by chapter 6 and 7. They take a big census in chapter 8. Ezra stands up and he reads the law. And the people are really blown away by what they hear in the law. And they have this Feast of Booths and it's a, it's a big deal. And at the end of the Feast of Booths, we come into chapter 9. It says, On the 24th day of this month, the sons of Israel assembled with fasting, in sackcloth with dirt upon them. The descendants of Israel separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. While they stood in their place, they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a fourth of the day. And for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. Now on the Levites' platform stood a group of Levites, and with a loud voice to the Lord their God, uh, they cried. And the Levites, same group as before, said, Arise, bless the Lord your God forever and ever. O may your glorious name be blessed and exalted above all blessing and praise. And this prayer, or I guess it's a, it's a psalm of praise, but it continues through the rest of Nehemiah 9. And what's really interesting about this prayer is that it's praising God not exactly for the things that He has done, but for who God is. We see them praising Him. They say, look God, our forefathers messed up, and yet you still had mercy on them. And you helped them, and you put them back on their feet, and then they turned against you again, and you still had mercy on them. And through the whole ordeal, you are holy. And so, this is the contrast I'd like to make tonight, is why are we doing the things that we are doing for God? Are we doing it so that because we are holy people, and that's what holy people do, 
Or are we doing it because God is holy? And because God is holy, we want to serve Him from ourselves. And I think, of course, the second is the right point of view. And I'll put in a disclaimer that we are to be holy, of course, and we know that, and that's actually the last passage, so that's the finale, you'll get to hear that. Uh, but the last passage is you know, the idea of be holy for I am holy. So this is an important idea, but the purpose for our holiness shouldn't be from a prideful point of view, it should be to be a servant to God. And so, I'm going to look at two different reasons why it's important to serve God uh, because God is holy. Uh, The first of which is pride, that when you serve yourself and when you're holy for yourself, that only builds pride. And then the second is a component of that, that when you're serving yourself and you're doing all these things for yourself, then it loses the whole purpose. On the contrast, when you're looking at God and God's holiness you can be nothing but humbled. And when you're serving God because God is holy, that's truly when the purpose of your work comes out. So, we're going to address the pride part first. So, turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 18. And this is, of course, a very common passage that we all know. It's the, the, the parable of the Pharisee and the publican and their prayer. But it's very topical, as you'll see, Uh, Luke 18, beginning in verse 9, it says, And he told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. I think that's exactly what we're talking about. So we continue with the parable. Two men went up to the temple to to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was not even willing to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to be a sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. So, in this we see a very clear and um, it's a very clear indication of the way that having this view of self righteousness can affect your pride and can affect your relationship with God, because. We see the prayer that the Pharisee offers isn't satisfying. It's really just him standing before God and talking to God about how good he is, which is outrageous, honestly. Um, But if we contrast that now looking at David in Psalm 51, we see a completely different idea. We see in David a prayer that is completely humbled by God's holiness and by David's inadequacy toward that. And Psalm 51, beginning in verse 10, says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that I may that my mouth may declare your praise. Here we see a prayer to God that is totally humbled by God's holiness and by his Uh, lack thereof. We see him so earnestly pleading for God to fill him and to make uh, him holy and to purify him. The purpose behind that we see, he says in um, 13, to to teach transgressors the way so that sinners will be converted. So that in 14 to 15 that his mouth can open and praise God. That's what we see in the prayer of a man who's looking to God as holy. Asking God to come in him and make his life an example of praise toward God and not the opposite. 
The second thing I want to look at as far as pride is in the same passage in Mark 2 that we saw just a couple verses earlier. So in Mark 2, beginning in verse 15, it happened that he was reclining at the table and his house and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many of them and they were following him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why is he eating and drinking with sinners and tax collectors? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I do not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So, again, we see this attitude that is exhibited in uh, Luke 18. The idea of these people who thought that they were righteous and were looking at others with contempt. This is exactly what's going on here. And as a result, their view toward, uh, toward sinners is really awful. And while, of course, we need to not condone sin... God came to save sinners. And so if we view sinners in this atmosphere and we don't recognize ourselves as also being a sinner, then we lose this whole idea of what really is the gospel. And we can contrast that again with Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 beginning in verse 8. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill fathers and mothers, and for murderers, immoral men, homosexuals, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which I have been entrusted. So immediately we see Paul pointing out, there are sins that exist, but I can't judge them from my stance. I am judging them on the word of God, because God is holy and not me. And we see as we continue that come out even more. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful putting me into service even though I was formerly a blasphemer a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason, I found mercy so that in me, as the foremost Jesus Christ might demonstrate His perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in Him for eternal life. Paul here is opening up his heart to these people. We see him saying, yes, I was messed up. I had a lot of problems. And continues, of course, because he's human. But what he says is that in these problems and in these faults, in his total lack of holiness, God's holiness shines forth from him. God's mercy is shown. And I think that if we can put this in our hearts and in our lives, we can be so much more of an effective servant toward God. And that leads into the next part, which is purpose. With God and with God's holiness, there is purpose to all that we do. Without Him, it's utter purposelessness. We already talked about in Mark 2 that their fasting had lost its purpose. We see very clearly that the prayers of the Pharisee in Luke 18 are also purposeless. And we see but and also as we continue on the contrary we see the exact opposite going on with people who are praying to God viewing God's holiness. After After Psalm 51, we see, or at the end of what we read from Psalm 51, we see him asking for purification for the purpose of glorifying God. 
we see in Nehemiah 9, after they offer this prayer, that they make a purpose to follow God's will. And they make very specific steps, and they say, this is how we're going to follow it. And when you think about it, the Christianity at its core's purpose is to show God's holiness. We can see that so clearly in Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, beginning in verse verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. So right off the bat in this passage, we see... The gospel is showing the righteousness of God. And then as we continue, we see uh, in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed to heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of man who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident with them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what he's been made, so they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image and form of corruptible man, of birds, of four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Here, again, we see very clearly that the people viewed themselves as being wise. They viewed themselves uh, in, in this sense that wasn't allowing the holiness of God to shine through. They knew God, but they weren't honoring Him as God. They were honoring themselves as God as they tried to show themselves to be holy. Another point besides purposeness, purposelessness even, is hopelessness. We see as we continue in Romans, the story, uh, it, it tells the story of Elijah in Romans 11, very briefly, and it says in Romans 11, verse 3, Lord, they killed your prophets, they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left. They are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So, this is a short snippet, but the motivation behind the question that we see from Elijah is that he's lost sight of God. When he's looking to himself, he says, Look, I'm the only righteous person. And, but God says, Look, there are other people around you. If you can trust in me, and trust in my holiness, in my power, I can deliver you. And we see that also really clearly in 1 Peter chapter 1. In verse 3, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, because we can trust in God, because God has given us salvation, we have a hope. We don't have to look at ourselves. We can look to God. And His holiness, His mercy, His love is the only thing that is going to get us salvation and the only thing that we can boast in. Hold your finger at 1 Peter 1 because we're going to come back there in just a second. But I want to go back to Romans again. Uh, this time Romans chapter 3. And um, the Jews in this time really had the this problem, or at least a similar problem to the one we're talking about. They were trusting in their Jewishness to save them. And they had lost sight again of what it was to serve God. And so we see uh, Paul reminding them in Romans 3 beginning in verse 19, We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may, may become accountable to God. 
Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So we see immediately again, these people are told, you can't be justified by works. You can't be holy enough on your own to do any good. Well, you can't be holy holy enough on your own to be justified before God. But God, who is holy, who is just in all of these good things, is shown through, uh, through the law and through what we see. And so as we continue in 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all those who believe, for there is no distinction for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God He passed over the sin previously committed. For the demonstration I say of His righteousness at the present time so that He would be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So, in this, we see it reiterated to us that we can't be holy enough to even come close to God. And the more we try, the more we show how holy God is in comparison to us. We can't boast in ourselves. We can only boast in God. And so, as we see, uh, as, as when you finish that chapter in 31, do we nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. The idea that through faith in God we have salvation and as this salvation is given to us we use the law we follow the law to be holy as God is holy and so as I said we're going to turn back to 1 Peter 1 and read through the passage on being holy for God is holy 1 Peter 1 beginning in verse 13 well before I start that I'll say we viewed all of this stuff. We've seen God's holiness and His holiness which surpasses any futile attempt at holiness that we can reach. And as we view God's holiness and His grace and His love, we realize we need to serve Him. And so with that in mind, we see in verse 13, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who has called you, be holy yourself also in all your behavior. Because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address his Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself in fear during your time on this of the stay on earth, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like gold or silver from your futile ways of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are we are believers in Christ, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all glory like flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. So we see, because of God's holiness, we prepare our minds for action. We fix our hope totally and completely on the grace of God. Not on our holiness, not on anything that we can show to anyone else, but because God is holy, do we continue 
because God is holy, we are called to be holy. He is our hope. He is the only reason that we are worth anything. And yet, He is amazing. And He's given us this Word, He's given us this life, and all of these opportunities to shine His light and show His righteousness and His holiness to the world. In a way, because the Word of God never fades as we continue. And this is the Word which we have been given. And so tonight, I ask you to take a look at your life. Examine it. Why are you the way you are? Are you seeking to be, to, for other people to look at you and say, look, that's a holy guy? Or are you looking for people to see you and say, wow, he is shining the holiness and righteousness and love of God to all of us. And so, if you look at your life and you realize that you've not been showing God's glory the way that you need to have been, we can offer prayers for you at this time. Or if you've never been baptized, we can do that for you also. Whatever your need, please come forward as we sing.